Hello, I'm Alexandra Harrison, and I'd like to welcome you to this week's episode of Supporting Child Caregivers videos. Today I'm going to talk to you about good discipline with your preschool child. Most parents come to me with concerns about their child's behavior. They might ask, how do I get her to stop having tantrums? Or how do I help him stop beating up on his little brother? Or how do I get her to school in the morning without a huge fight? Well, what we used to call discipline, we sometimes now refer to as limit setting, as if that were a gentler way of talking about how to get your child to behave. I actually prefer the term discipline, especially when it's paired with the word good. Now, good discipline may sound like an oxymoron, but actually, I don't think it is, and I will explain why. The kind of discipline I'm talking about is helping grow your child's brain, and that is good. The kind of discipline I'm talking about is less about punishment and more about education, and that is also good. Uh, probably the book that I recommend the most consistently to parents is a book by Siegel and Basin called No Drama Discipline. And that book talks about discipline from a developmental perspective, and it, it explains how good discipline can help the brain grow. And of course, that's what I think too. Now, the word discipline, or if you prefer limit setting, sounds simple on the surface, but actually it's very complicated. And the way you discipline your child effectively requires an adjustment to fit the child's developmental age and the family situation. And that's why I'm going to record a series of videos on good discipline. Good discipline for your preschool child, which is what we're talking about today in this video. Good discipline for your school age child. Good discipline for your teenager. Good discipline in a co-parenting situation. Good discipline in sibling conflict. And good discipline for a special needs child. Let's start with discipline for your preschool child. Now I have to admit, preschool is my favorite age, and that's because the meanings that preschool children make of themselves and their world are so interesting and so different from the meanings that we as adults make. I have some general guidelines for discipline, or if you prefer limit setting, for all ages and family situations. Number one, Validate a child's feelings and help him or her self-regulate. Number two, try to understand the meaning of the child that the child makes of the situation that's making him or her upset. And number three, create a response that includes the necessary containment and learning opportunity. We can make these guidelines simpler by calling them one, validate and regulate, two, understand, and three, respond. Now, interestingly, the step of validating a child's emotions is the first step that's frequently missed. I think that's mainly because the parent believes that the most important thing is to stop this out-of-control bad behavior. And the problem behavior upsets the parent and makes him angry and maybe anxious the last thing that an angry, anxious parent feels like doing is to validating his child's behavior. But that step is necessary, and I'm going to explain why. By the way, I frequently tell preschool parents, preschool children's parents, that it's wonderful for them to start practicing validating their child's feelings when they are trying to set limits on their behavior. And that reason is because when the child grows up to be a teenager, the child, the teenager's reasons for uh, their problem behavior are so irrational and hard to understand 
that it will be great for the parents to have practiced validating the child's feelings first when they're preschool because then they will be ahead of the game by the time the child gets to be a teenager. They will be prepared. Now, what do I mean by validating a child's behavior? Well, I mean that recognizing that they are struggling with very painful and intense feelings, and these children, these feelings make sense in the child's world at that moment. That means that you tell the child with your voice and your facial expression that you understand how awful it is to feel so frustrated and disappointed and angry. And when you do, you are making a connection to the child, with the child, in the child's emotional state. And that is the first step to helping the child get regulated or helping the child get into control. Of course, sometimes by the time you get to the child, the child is way out of control and can't listen to you even if you validate her feelings very well. And in that case, you have to help her get into control first and then talk about her feelings. But whenever possible, I recommend validating her feelings first. The second part to this first guideline is regulate. That means to help the child become calm so that he can learn what you have to say. When a child is not calm, when he's upset, we call it dysregulated. And think of that your child when he or she was a baby. And think of how that child was fussy and sometimes screaming. Well, it's not very different from the way your preschool child feels and acts. And you can think about the way uh, you need to be able to help the child calm down in order to listen to you. Get out of that fussy or screaming state in order to listen to you. Now, sometimes the child will calm down just by being able to tell you what it was that happened that was so wrong that made them feel so terrible and validating the child's feelings about it. And that's easy. But other times the child needs to be removed from the situation that has made her so upset. Some children respond well to times out, to uh, putting the child in her bedroom or in a chair in a quiet part of the room, giving her a chance to calm down. But other children get more distressed and out of control in timeouts. So try to remember what was best to console your child when she was a baby. Did it help her if you looked into her eyes quietly? Did it help her to talk quietly to her? Did it help her to hold her, to rock her? Don't be afraid to console or to, to comfort a child, a preschool child, when he or she is upset. You'll have plenty of times, chances to teach the consequence of her behavior later on when she's calm. Uh, Dan Siegel, the author, one of the authors of this No Drama Discipline book, has a wonderful way of teaching about the brain and how the brain controls behavior, which he calls the hand model of the brain, or which I call Siegel's hand model of the brain. Hold up your hand. Your wrist represents the brain stem, which manages the most basic regulatory states, such as respiration and heart rate. That's the first part of the brain to develop. Then fold your thumb across your palm. That represents the limbic system, which is, it, the limbic system plays a big role in emotional experience and control. That develops next. Then finally you curl your fingers over your thumb and your four fingers represent the cerebral cortex, the most advanced part of your brain. That doesn't even come online until the child is about one year old. Now, as the most advanced part of the brain, the cortex is the part of the brain that governs, governs more complex processes of thinking and language. And one of the most brilliant parts of this model is that you can imagine all the interconnections of the brain because if you look at your hand, you can see that the limbic system or your thumb is inside your fingers, which is the cortex. So you can see or imagine that you can see all the neural interconnections between the cortex and the limbic system, and also the neural connections between your 
limbic system and cortex and the brain stem, which is your wrist. Now, all parts of the brain play a role in state regulation in a bottom up and top down direction. In another wonderful illustration, Dan Siegel shows how if you flip your lid, exposing your thumb, which is disconnecting your thinking part of the brain, this illustrates um, what the mistake that I was mentioning that parents often make. It's trying to reason with the child when the child is functioning with his emotional brain and it doesn't work. The thinking brain stops working when the emotional brain takes over. So since the cortex, the thinking brain, is the lat latest part of the brain to develop, it's less well developed in preschool children and that explains one reason anyway why preschool children have a harder time thinking through a problem instead of getting quickly frustrated and disappointed or angry. Now we're ready to talk about the second guideline in good discipline, and that is understanding the meaning. Now this is particularly tricky in preschoolers, although it will seem equally tricky in teenagers, because teenagers can be really irrational at times, especially when they're upset. Wait a minute, does that sound like a familiar theme in this talk? It's very hard to, to reason. Don't expect your child to be rational when they're very upset. That's true of all ages. Of course, it goes for adults like parents, too. Now, when your preschooler is calm and can listen to even a little bit, try to take the time to understand the reason that they are upset. What is the meaning that is upsetting them? Is the meaning that his world has fallen apart because his Lego fort has fallen down and, and he can't put it together again? or? Does the, is the meaning that she's a failure because she couldn't run as fast as her friend? However much you want to reassure your child, please do not. At least before you take the time to consider the child's meaning, don't just say, oh, it's only Legos, we can do it, we can build it up again. Or don't just say to the little girl, well, you're really a fast reader. You're a faster reader than most of your friends. Don't worry if you can't run as fast as she can. Um, before you spend some time uh, thinking about what the experience has been like for a child, don't try to reassure them. Try to, get a, try to imagine what the child felt like when what he'd been working, for, working on for so long just collapsed and he doesn't see a way of making it better and trying to um, try to imagine what it would feel like to be left in the dust in a race after you have some sense of what what your child has experienced has suffered in its disappointment or frustration and you can bend your mind so that you can start to imagine some similar situation in your life when you might have felt sort of the same way then you can begin a reasonable discussion with your child. Then when you tell your child about all the good things she's all the things she's good at besides running, then you will be more convincing. Or when you tell your child that you'll help him build his Lego fort again and then you can take a picture of it before it falls down again, then he will be more likely to listen. Just think that a partner in rebuilding is a partner who can understand the meaning of what the rebuilding is all about. Finally, we're ready for the response part of the guidelines. And one problem I've told you about before is parents skipping the first two steps and jumping to the last one, probably in part because they're so mad that they want their child to suffer the consequences of their behavior, but also, as I mentioned before, because the parent feels out of control of a bad situation and wants to exert instant control. Well, of course, this is a mistake for many reasons. One important reason is that when the parent is very distressed, very upset, the parent's heightened emotional state is going to be contagious. It's going to escalate the child's emotional state and make the child much less likely to learn. And remember, that's the point of this good discipline, is to help, to help the child learn the consequences of his behavior in a manageable way, without shame, without excessive shame and distress. 
You don't want the child to comply out of fear for reasons that we will talk about in a subsequent video. In fact, if you do a good job with the first two steps, sometimes you can create a repair, and that is a great solution. For example, you can fix the toy that got broken, or if the child made a huge mess in the kitchen throwing food around, you can help the child clean up the mess. Or if the child threw all her books on the floor and all of her toys on the floor off her shelves in her bedroom, you can help her pick them up. You and the child, don't expect the child to do this by, by the child's self, by him or herself um, in the preschool age, because the child needs your presence probably to maintain the state of calm and control and also to organize the steps that it takes to do the repair. But it's really worth it for you to do it with your child because you're teaching him something very powerful in this collaboration of repair. You're teaching him, for example, that when he screws up, he can repair the damage. Or when she thinks that all is lost in life, there's hope. So think of what an important lesson that is to teach your child. It's really... Um, learn the best in the context of a supportive caregiving relationship, your relationship with your child. Now, maybe creating a repair is impossible and thinking of a reasonable natural consequence can be very challenging because a natural consequence means helping the child manage the disappointment and frustration or painful feelings that come when she makes a mistake. Examples might be no dessert if she makes a fuss during mealtime or has a tantrum during mealtime or um, in one book instead of two if he delays too long in getting ready for bed or um, uh, putting away the new toy if the new toy was thrown on the floor in frustration or five minutes off screen time the next time if he refused to get off the screen. Now often parents tell me that they've tried everything and any suggestion that I make doesn't work. Now, I sympathize with this position, but typically what is going on is that the parents and child have gotten into a problem pattern, and before any reasonable response can be made, the problem pattern has to be undone. And the way that that happens is when the parents change their behavior so that the child will not slip into the old problem behavior and invite the parents to join them with out of awareness, implicitly, of course. Now, how do parents change their behavior? Well, by following the step one, validate and regulate, step two, understand, and step three, respond sequence. Once a problem pattern has been established, usually it's the case that one of the first two steps has been skipped. And so if you think that no consequence will work, Think of the three-step sequence and try again. We can talk more about other natural consequences in our next videos about good discipline with school-age children and teenagers. So thank you for viewing this video and remember to watch the next video on our Supporting Child Caregivers YouTube channel or on our website, supportingchildcaregivers.org.